Right, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to have Dr. Horton come up. He's an economics professor here at UCA, and he's going to introduce our guest speaker for the day. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce my old friend, uh, no, not old, uh, <laughs> good friend, no, wait, old friend. <laughs> Here, being politically incorrect is the right thing to do. Uh, one of my greatest successes as Dean of the College of Business here at UCA was attracting Walter to come here to join our faculty. We got him, he came here from Holy Cross, a fine Jesuit institution in Worcester, Mass. But those Jesuits, they just won't give up. Uh, Loyola of New Orleans lured him away from us with an endowed chair. So he is now the Harold E. Worth Endowed Professor of Economics at Loyola of New Orleans. He has taught at other institutions such as Rutgers, Stony Brook, Baruch College. His PhD is from Columbia University. Walter Block is one of the best known Austrian school economists in the world and an international leader of the movement for freedom. He's the author of over 400 professional articles and countless journal, art journal articles and uh, columns directed at the general public. He's written two dozen books. His first book, Defending the Undefendable, has been translated into a dozen languages. It's regarded as a classic of clear but rigorous economic analysis, as well as a classic of libertarianism. I believe Walter will have something more to say about the topics in it a bit later. I believe he may also comment on his latest book, Yes, to Ron Paul and Liberty. He has been a friend of Ron Paul since the 1970s. He also know, knew Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, Ayn Rand, and Murray Rothbard, among the luminaries of the libertarian movement. We're fortunate to have Dr. Block here this afternoon because he is in great demand as a lecturer and leader of seminars. I congratulate Zach Kubin, Stephen Gross, and Brittany Logan on getting such an outstanding speaker for us. Uh, they are making Young Americans for Liberty one of the most successful student organizations we have ever had at UCA. Dr. Block always challenges the conventional wisdom about economics and the preconceptions which many people have about the way the world works. We are in for a real treat this afternoon as he does this again. I'll turn it over to Walt. Boy, after that introduction, I've got to be good. <laughs> Boy, I'm in trouble. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I taught at uh, UCA from 1997 to 2001. Joe was my boss. He was the dean. I was a professor here. It's really good to see old friends of mine, colleagues of mine, and, and new friends of mine, students. So I'm just delighted to be here, and thanks for coming out. What I want to talk about is libertarianism and... Libertarianism, the way I see it at least, and if you get 10 libertarians in a room, you're going to have 11 views as to what libertarianism is. But the way I see it, it's really based on two sides of one coin. And one side is the non-aggression axiom. Namely, it's illicit to initiate violence against people, to grab them without their consent, to grab their property. Uh, it's wrong. It's improper, immoral. And it's a violation of the non-aggressive principle, which says pretty much <laughs> to yourself. 
So if I were to go over to my friend Bill and punch him, that would be a violation of the non-aggression principle. If I were to go uh, to someone else, Joe, and grab his watch, that would also be a violation of the non-aggression principle. Now most people, when you tell them this, they'd say, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, most people don't grab each other without each other's permission. Uh, most people don't rob or steal or rape or murder. Uh, so what's the big deal about libertarianism if that's all the non-aggression principle is? Well, the distinction that we libertarians have from other people is that we're really serious about this, maybe even rabid about it. Namely, we look at the world of human action through the eyeglasses, eyeglasses of this non-aggression principle, and we allow no exceptions. So that's sort of rabid. Let me give you an example right away of how radical it can be. It really implies, logically, anarchism. Because the government is an organization that violates the non-aggression principle. It taxes you, even though you haven't agreed to pay. Now they say that you've agreed by being here, by being in the country, but, you know, who are they to say that? Uh, they have no more right to be here than we have to be here, to say the libertarian. So it's a very, very radical kind of a principle. Now, most libertarians aren't anarchists. They're what are called minarchists, or minimal government libertarians. This would be the view of Ayn Rand, Ron Paul, and other libertarian luminaries, where they say that the government has one function, and that's to protect person and property against aggression. And to that end, it has only three legitimate purposes, or functions, one, or institutions. One, armies, to keep foreign bad guys off of us. Police, to keep local bad guys off of us. And courts, to determine who the good guys and the bad guys are. Okay, so that's one side of the libertarian coin. What's the other side of the libertarian coin? The other side of the libertarian coin is property rights. Because I said before, it would be wrong if I went over to Joe and took his watch. But that's not really strictly speaking true, because he might have stolen it from me yesterday, and now if I go over there and grab it from him, I'm not stealing it from him, rather I'm repossessing it. So we need a theory of property rights to determine whether something is an, initi an initiatory aggression or not. And libertarians base their views on property rights from John Locke. And John Locke had this theory that if you mix your labor with the, the land or with some part of virgin territory, you get to own it in that way. And there are gray areas on how long do you have to mix it, how intensively do you have to mix it. But the bottom line is, you mix your labor with the land, you get to own the land. Now suppose I mix my labor with land, and I grow corn, and you mix your labor with a wild cow and domesticate the cow, and I have corn, wheat or something, and you have milk. Uh, Robert Nozick, another very famous libertarian, talked about legitimate title transfer theory. And what this means is that anything voluntary is a legitimate title transfer. So, for example, barter. I could trade you uh, some a bushel of corn for a couple of gallons of milk. Now I own the milk, even though I didn't produce it, but I can trace it back to legitimate uh, initial homesteading plus voluntary trade as in barter. And you now have some corn, even though you didn't grow the corn, and, but you can trace it back uh, uh, because you, uh, gave the, you got the corn based on milk. So what are other legitimate title transfers besides barter? Buying and selling. I bought this jacket. I now own it, and the guy who sold it to me has the money that I gave him for it. Gambling would be another way, or gifts. Any legitimate title transfer. And now we have both sides of the libertarian coin. The non-aggression principle and the um, uh, private property rights based on title transfer. Now, with this coin, with the two sides of the coin, you can... Uh, come, you can look at almost anything that's going on and say whether it's legitimate or illegitimate. And what libertarianism is, is a theory of what is proper law. And the proper law is, you know, keep your mitts to yourself. Unless you have permission from someone, which I mentioned before. For example, if you get into a boxing ring, I get into a boxing ring with Joe over here, Garrity, and he punches me in the jaw, I can't say, oh, assault and battery, arrest him. 
because I've agreed to be punched and punch him up as long as it's above the belt. So that would be a legitimate uh, use of violence. Libertarians are not pacifists, but that would be a legitimate use of violence. Or voluntary sadomasochism. You know, uh, you don't, don't knock it until you've tried it, you weirdos. <laughs> you have your own well, you, know, you can have voluntary sadomasochism. And you know what the, uh, the, the masochist said to the sadist beat me? And you know what the sadist said? No. That would be worse, because he wants to be. Okay, so you, here you have the basic principles, the premises of libertarianism. And what I did in these two books is I try to apply it to all sorts of cases. This book is sort of my dedication to Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which along with Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug were the two books that converted me to libertarianism. Before that, I was some sort of pinko, ignoramus, whatever. <laughs> Uh, Hazlitt's book had one principle, um, and it had 35 uh, implications or 35 examples of it. Um, this book has one principle also, namely that coin of libertarianism, and also got 35 different applications of it. And let me read you the chapter titles. To, I wouldn't be able to cover them all, because they take way too long, but I can cover a few of them. And what I did in this book is I said to myself, are there any actions that are either illegal or hated and reviled by everyone that, that do not violate the non-aggression principle? And if there were any, and I found quite a few, then I would defend them. So, for example, the prostitute. As long as the prostitute engages in prostitution with other consenting adults, she or he, because there are male prostitutes, does not violate the non-aggression principle. Does that mean I favor prostitution? No. I think it's immoral. I think the, the right way for people to interact is not in that way. I have a daughter. I wouldn't want her to be a prostitute. But if she were, I wouldn't want her to go to jail for it. So there's a distinction between favoring the thing and favoring the legalization of the thing. And all I do is favor the legalization. I say it should be legal. People shouldn't go to jail for this because they didn't violate the libertarian axioms. Okay, so one is the prostitute, the other is the pimp, male chauvinist pig, drug pusher, drug addict, blackmailer, slibel, slibeler, slanderer and libeler, sorry, <laughs> the denier of academic freedom, the advertiser, the person who yells fire in a crowded theater. That's a very important one because uh, Justice Holmes said, well, you know, free speech is an absolute, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, and, in this chapter, I say you can under certain circumstances. The gypsy cab driver, the ticket scalper, the dishonest cop, the non-government counterfeiter, the miser, the inheritor, the money lender, the non-contributor to charity, the curmudgeon, the slumlord, the ghetto merchant, the speculator, the importer, the middleman, the profiteer, the strip liner, the litterer, the waste maker, the fat capitalist pig employer, the scab, the rate buster, and the employer of child labor. So what I say is that in all these cases, the people who perpetrate these activities or engage in these activities, some of them may not be nice, but none of them violate the libertarian axiom of non-aggression, and therefore they all should be legal. And what I do in this book, and by the way, this book is 15 bucks, buy it over there. This one's 25 bucks, buy it. They're very heavy, I don't want to go back to New Orleans with them, so get a few of them afterward. This is my book, Yes to Ron Paul and Liberty. Uh, over here, uh, when I came from the Little Rock Airport, two people picked me up, the offices of Young Americans for Liberty, and I asked them, how did you come to be a libertarian? And both of them said, Ron Paul. Ron Paul is probably responsible for converting more people to libertarianism than maybe anyone else. The only person I can think of who is a competitor for Ron Paul for the uh, accolade of the, uh, converting people to paternism would be Ayn Rand. Her book, Atlas Shrugged, came out in 1957 and is still selling over 100,000 copies a year. She wasn't a libertarian. She didn't consider herself a libertarian. She rejected libertarianism. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you could ask her in the question. <laughs> but many people read her book and became libertarians. There's now a movie, two parts, a uh, three-part series. I, I urge you to go see that. So these are the two people who have converted more people than anyone else to libertarianism. Uh, and 
I think we owe them a debt of gratitude because as far as I'm concerned, libertarianism is the difference between civilization and barbarianism. And it is barbaric to hit people that haven't hit you at all. It's barbaric to go over to people and rape them or murder them or steal from them. It's just disgusting and barbaric. And libertarianism is the only philosophy that I know of that makes it as a matter of principle to not do that sort of a thing. So I think we owe Ayn Rand and Ron Paul a great debt of gratitude. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend about 10 minutes going over this book, the Ron Paul book, and then instead of going over the chapters, what I'll do, uh, there was this um, circular here made out, Young Americans for Liberty, UCA chapter, defends defending the undefendable, renowned economists, Walter Block defends prostitutes, drug dealers, capitalist pigs, and male chauvinists. So I'll go over those four. <laughs> so no one will accuse us of fraudulent advertising. <laughs> Then I will have questions and discussion. Okay, so what's going on with the Ron Paul book? Well, if Ron Paul stands for anything, he stands for three things, namely the three things in political economy. Zach mentioned two of them. He mentioned economic liberty and personal liberty. The third one, of course, is foreign policy. Those are the three things that Ron Paul is known for. Unique views on foreign policy, on economic liberty, and on personal liberty. And it's unusual. You see, a lot of people, they think that if you favor economic liberty, you, you have to be against personal liberty. And if you favor personal liberty, you have to get, be against economic liberty. <clears throat> because the first position is roughly the, the view of the conservatives, who sort of vaguely favor economic liberty, but you oppose, you know, like legalizing uh, drugs or prostitution. And uh, the liberals do the other. They favor that, although Obama doesn't, but... Not really a good liberal. Uh, but he said he doesn't favor economic liberty, and both of them are just gone off on foreign policy. So let me start with foreign policy. Ron Paul got into it with uh, Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York, and uh, Ron Paul said, you know, that uh, the reason they bombed us in 9 11 is we were there, and they were reacting to that, namely it's blowback, which the CIA said it was. And Rudy got up on his high horse and said, oh, no, this is uh, unconscionable. You can't say this. I've never heard this. <laughs> We've been in uh, the Middle East for many, many years. Uh, we, Madeleine Albright said when she was told that 500,000 children in Iraq were killed, she said it was worth it. I mean, Himmler couldn't do much better than that. <laughs> That's pretty despicable. The U.S. military budget is bigger than the military budget of the next 14 countries with their military budgets. The U.S. military budget is about half the world's military budget, and they call it defense. <laughs> we, the U.S., not we, but them, the U.S., has 800, some eight or 900 military bases in about 200 different countries. The numbers keep changing. In only about 250 countries. And they call it defense. Imagine if any other country did that. Imagine if Portugal or Brazil or China had military bases all over the place and soldiers and half the, uh, the uh, armament budget of, of the whole world. Would we consider that um, defense? I mean, when you go to a basketball game, when the opposite team has got the ball, everyone yelling, defense, defense. And when we've got the ball, we don't yell that. Namely, we can distinguish between offense and defense in basketball. Anyone can, right? And yet here, we can. And what Ron Paul is saying is that the U.S. is an offensive, imperialistic country. We're not the freest country in the world. We're the mass murderers of the world now. We should be ashamed of what they're doing in our name. So Ron Paul's view on foreign policy is very much against what uh, Obama and uh, Romney was saying. And both of them are warmongers. I slightly favored Obama over Romney because I think that while Obama is a warmonger, Romney seemed like weird. I mean, you know, <laughs> China over um, over uh, currency uh, devaluation, so-called. Although when I get to the Fed, uh, we'll see who's the currency devaluator. Uh, he wants to go to Iran and kill him. I mean, it, Obama had four years to go to Iran and he hasn't. So uh, I sort of favored him slightly, and I think foreign policy is more important than these other two put together. So obviously I favored Gary Johnson, who was uh, running for the Libertarian Party, and 
he was good in all three areas. But if I had a pick, if someone came up with a gun and said, you must pick between Obama and, and Romney, yeah, I would have picked um, Obama. So I'm, I mean, God knows who he's going to pick for the Supreme Court. That's <laughs> horrible. But, uh, you know, if you have two bad things, the, the least bad is still pretty bad. Okay, so Ron Paul's view on foreign policy is very consistent with the anti-war leftists who would protest Republican wars but never Democratic wars, which seems a little hypocritical. The libertarians protest all wars. Uh, no, sorry, not all wars, all offensive wars. We favor defensive wars. If someone attacks us, we can kick their butt. We should have a gigantic... Uh, uh, Coast Guard, a very, very powerful Coast Guard, Coast Guard that doesn't have uh, soldiers all around the world. I mean, when you have soldiers all around the world, anytime two tribes get into it, we're there. We should pull back all the troops. Ron Paul says that we just marched in, we can just march out. It'd take a couple of days and all the troops come home. And if you really support the troops, you don't support them killing innocent people abroad. You support them being here protecting us. That's if you're a minarchist. Okay, so much for foreign policy. Let's do personal liberties. Thank God for Colorado and Washington. <laughs> and I understand that Arkansas almost voted to legalize uh, uh, marijuana for not for the medical purposes, but for uh, recreational purposes. Now, this is just for consenting adults. This is not for children. Uh, this doesn't mean... Uh, I mean, have we learned nothing from prohibition? We had prohibition from, what was it, 1917 to 1937 or somewhere in there. The, the marijuana laws were, are very, very racist laws. They are racist in their inception. They were initially meant as an attack on Chinese people, Orientals, who would use opium dens. And uh, we wanted to disaccommodate them, so we said, well, they go to opium dens. These are just cough drops. It's not. <laughs> Uh, so it was a very racist law. It's very racist right now in its inception because disproportionately young black men are being killed and are in jail. Uh, very disproportionate numbers. If I were the head of the, or leader of the black community and young members of my uh, community were killing each other over drugs, I would talk about that a little bit. I would be concerned about that. Uh, black leadership, I don't think is uh, as concerned about it as they should be. Look, if you legalize this stuff, it doesn't mean that everyone uses it. Portugal had legalized it 10 years ago, and the amount of use went down. Nobody goes to a schoolyard now and says, hey kid, you want to buy some chocolate? <laughs> because chocolate is legal, but if chocolate were prohibited, you'd have vast profits made in chocolate, and then there'd be people killing each other over chocolate. I mean, it, it's the same thing, whether it's chocolate, whether it's alcohol, whether it's uh, marijuana or cocaine or anything like that. The problem is not uh, the use of these things, the problem is the prohibition. You get a gigantic amount of profits involved in, in selling these illicit drugs. And, and the DEA is never going to win. Because every time they sort of win, every time they interdict the shipment, those of you in economics know that which way does the supply curve shift? To the left, there's less drugs available in the market, which means the prices go up, which means the profits go up, which means they get more power. So every time you have a success, it's a failure. So how are you going to win there? They, they, there were two gods in Greek mythology, and uh, one god was the son of the Mother Earth, Gaia, I guess, and every time the other god knocked me down, came up stronger. Well, look, I could beat Mike Tyson at his, at his uh, apex if, if you had that rule that every time he knocked me down, I came up stronger. And every time I hit him, rarely, but once in a while, <laughs> uh, he became weaker. So Ron Paul says that we should legalize drugs, and this puts him on the far left of the political spectrum, which is a silly sort of spectrum. Okay, so we, we did foreign policy, we did economic policy, we did um, personal liberties. Uh, now let's do a little bit of economics, a la Ron Paul. Ron Paul is mostly known for ending the Fed. End the Fed is one of the uh, cries that his followers use. <coughs> Well, what's the Fed? What's the Fed doing? Well, the Fed came about in 1913, 
And if you look at the 100 years before 1913, and the 100 years roughly after 1913, namely the 2012, which is 99 years, and you look at the, uh, the business cycle oscillations, before the Fed, they were a little bit, and they were all due to government interference. Afterward, they're, they're just gigantic. So if the Fed's uh, goal or role is to, is to iron out the oscillations of the business cycle, they're not doing it. Another goal of the Fed is to have um, uh, control over prices, price inflation. Well, when they started in 1913, a, a 1913 dollar was worth a 1913 dollar. What's a dollar worth now? Three or four cents. So they've lost most of the value of the dollar. And this is very important because money, apart from barter, is one half of every transaction. It pervades the entire economy. He who controls the money, um, controls the economy, and the way the Fed is controlling it is they're creating business cycles and they're creating all sorts of problems. I think only the Austrian economic insight is correct. See, the way the Keynesians see it, and there are right-wing Keynesians and left-wing Keynesians, the right-wing Keynesians are the monetarists like Milton Friedman. Hey, go. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke, but it's not a joke. The left-wing Keynesians believe in fiscal policy, the right-wing Keynesians believe in monetary policy, but they both believe that the economy is sort of like a car. And it'll either go too slow or go too fast. And if it goes too slow, you have to pump it up. And you either pump it up with fiscal policy or monetary policy. If it's going too slow uh, and too fast, you have to slow it down, either through monetary or fiscal policy again. What about stagflation? Stagflation means it's going too fast and too slow at the same time. Arthur Burns, before the advent of stagflation, was once asked, well, suppose you had stagflation. And he said, ha, 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 then we all have to resign. <laughs> well, these guys should resign. Greenspan and Demanke, they should all resign because they haven't got a clue as to how to solve this problem. The Austrians do. The Austrians don't say that the car is either going too fast or going too slow. What they say is that when you lower the interest rate, what you do is you artificially encourage long-term investments and you artificially, relatively discourage short-term investments. So what we've got is too many houses and cars and mines and stuff like that and not enough other things. And the problem of the depression, or the recession, the super recession that we now have, is not one of too much or too little, but rather a misallocation of resources. Let's take two other resources as an example <clears throat> that might be easy to wrap our minds around other than long-term and short-term. Suppose we took carrots and shoes. Now, right now, as far as I know, there is no misallocation of resources between carrots and shoes. Because if we had too many carrots and too few shoes, there'd be less profits in carrots and people would make losses and get out of carrots. And if we had too, many, too few shoes, there'd be great profits in shoes which would push up shoes. So shoes and carrots would equilibrate, right? There's no, no big problem with that misallocation. But suppose the government, in its infinite wisdom, just uh, subsidized the carrot. Well, then, then entrepreneurs would be led as if by an Adam Smith's invisible hand into producing too many carrots and too few shoes. And we'd have carrots up to our armpits, and we'd be wondering where we're going to get our next shoe from. And that is the problem that the Austrians see, and this is the, uh, the view that Ron Paul is espousing. Okay, so I've discussed a little bit about Ron Paul. There's a lot more in this book. Um, obviously, it's 400 pages, so I've got a lot of stuff in there trying to promote his uh, candidacy and things like that. Okay, let me talk a little bit now about this other book, Defending the Undefendable, and I will go over the ones that we're discussing here. I already did discuss prostitutes a little bit. Look, prostitution is legal in every county in uh, Nevada except for Las Vegas. And what's going on there? Are women being brutalized? No. Are customers being brutalized by diseases or something like that? Again, no. It's much safer uh, for both the uh, provider of the service and the demander of the service. Now, again, I'm not favoring prostitution. I, I think it's an improper kind of a thing. I wouldn't want my kids to do it. I don't advocate it for any of you to do it. But if it's being done, should, be, should people be put in jail? And then they have to go underground. And then, then the pimps can prey on them. 
So I think it's a much more sensible way. And not only in Nevada do we have that, but we have that all through Europe, and there, there are no problems. The problems occur not from prostitution, although some problems do occur from that, but from the provision of it. And you get cops who are on the take and, and disrespect the law and order, proper law and order, and all sorts of other problems. So I favor legalizing prostitution. When I wrote this book, it first came out in 1976, quite a few years ago. There was less of an appreciation for the legalization of prostitution than there is now. Okay, the second one on this list is drug dealers. I've already talked about that, so I don't have to spend much time on that. Capitalist pigs. Wink, wink. <laughs> Everyone's against capitalist pigs. They're greedy. Uh, who was that? Uh, Gordon Gecko was saying, greed is my god, or something like that. Look, there are two ways to get money. One is through voluntary exchange, and the other is through coercion. One is laissez-faire capitalism, and the other is crony capitalism. We don't favor crony capitalism, bailouts for Wall Street, bailouts for Detroit, bailouts for whoever. Look, if you favor bailouts, what about the bailouts for the typewriter people? What about the bailouts for uh, who the, the uh, people in Rochester, New York, that made the old films? Kodak. Kodak is going bust. What about the horse and buggy industry? There's nothing wrong with bankruptcy. Bankruptcy means that people no longer want the product you're providing. Uh, I have the, on my wall at school um, a poster that says, um, you wouldn't buy our shitty car, so we're going to make you pay for it anyway. <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what the bailout for Detroit is. What's wrong with the uh, cars from, I don't know where, uh, Kia or um, South Korea, Japan? Why do we have to produce cars? There's nothing written that we have to. We should compete with anyone else, and if we succeed, fine, and if not, fine. The reason we have unemployment is not because uh, we need Detroit. The reason we have unemployment is because government raises wages above productivity levels, whether through unions or through minimum wage, or, uh, and it encourages unemployment through unemployment insurance, and also the Fed creates vast unemployment by misallocating resources and putting pressure on the market to adjust. If the government weren't creating unemployment, we wouldn't have any unemployment. The idea here is we need a price system. The Soviets, the North Koreans, the East Germans showed that you have very intelligent people in Korea and both sides of Germany and in Russia. They've got all those grandmasters in chess. They're a bunch of bright people. And yet, they didn't have a free enterprise system. We need a free enterprise system to create goods and products under lower poverty rates, which we all want to do. And the way to do that is through capitalist pigs. Oink, oink. All it means is that you, the way you're going to earn your money is by satisfying consumers. McDonald's, uh, Walmart have done great, job, uh, great work for people, as shown by the fact that um, they're successful. Uh, in New Orleans, they wanted to open one, and there was a big fight over this. In New York City, they're not allowing any Walmarts in there because Walmart pays low wages, and they don't give health care, and this and that, and they're not unionized and all that. And yet, when Walmart opens up and they say, we can hire 400 people, you get 5,000 people trying to get those lousy jobs. How lousy can it be? I mean, there is such a thing as voting with your feet. It's the same thing as uh, uh, sweatshops. Somebody opens up a sweatshop in um, Bangladesh, and they pay a uh, dollar an hour or something, very low wage, or 50 cents an hour. And all the left liberals around here say, oh, this is unconscionable, this is greedy, this is capitalism, this is evil. But what were the wages before? Were they higher or lower or the same? Obviously, they were lower. Otherwise, people wouldn't go to work for the sweatshop. If people were making a dollar an hour, and the sweatshop said, oh, I'll offer you 50 cents an hour, people aren't going to go there. People similar with Walmart. If Walmart is so bad, why are so many people lining up around the block to get those jobs? So the capitalist pig is a hero. He's a great guy. He's the reason we have a reasonable standard of living, because we have more economic freedom in this country than elsewhere. One of my other books is Ranking Economic Freedom and Ranking GDP. And we find that of the 150 countries or so, the more economic freedom you have, the more wealth you have, and the more growth you have as well. Okay, the next one is ah, the male chauvinist. What's going on here? Why do women make 70 cents for every dollar that men make? 
Is it because of discrimination? Is it because of sexism? Is it because of um, the, the capitalist pig hates women? I mean, most capitalist pigs are men, and most men I know like women. You know, the hetero types like women. So you think if there's any discrimination going on, it would be in favor of women, not against women. So why then do we have a wage gap? Why do we have a glass ceiling? Which is a slightly different issue. Well, let's take the wage gap first. The reason we have a wage gap is because there's unequal representation in homework. Let me take a survey here. If you're married, answer this survey question in terms of your marriage. If you're not married, answer this question in terms of the marriage that you're most familiar with, presumably your parents' marriage. And I'll give you three choices. With regard to housework, homework, uh, Shopping, cooking, cleaning, childcare, uh, all those things. So when the kid wakes up at 3 in the morning, which person does most of the stuff, the wife or the husband? Wait, I'll, I'll, I'll do this more formally. I'll give you three choices. The husband does more, the wife does more, or it's equal. Raise your hands if you think that the wife does more of this stuff. Okay, I got most of the people. How many think it's equal in this marriage you're thinking? I got two or three liars. <laughs> How many people think that the husband does more? He's a house husband. One, one liar. Okay. I'm kidding. Uh, when I said liar, I'm kidding. I, but look at the, uh, there must be, I don't know, 200 people here, and I think about 180 people to say the wife did more, and maybe five people say it's equal, and one person is saying it's the other way. Look, um, what's his name, the, the great runner? Um, the guy who did the 100 yard dash. Um, Bolt. Bolt. Hussein Bolt. Hussein Bolt is a lousy cellist. How do I know this? Because there is such a thing in economics called alternative costs or opportunity costs. Namely, anytime you do something, you have to do something at the cost of something else that you could have done had you not been doing the first thing. Well, Hussein Bolt, the way to get to be a good runner is to run, not play the cello. So his running was the cost of being a great cellist. Yo-Yo Ma, who's a great cellist, is probably not a great runner. Every time you do something, you do it at the cost of something else you could have done. Well, when women do a lot of housework, 80-90% of the housework, they do it at the cost of not being able to do something else as well as they otherwise could have been able to do it had they not been doing all that housework. Right? It's the same sort of a thing. The reason... And one of the things that women could have been doing, had they not been doing all this housework, is being in the market, getting money through the market. The, so that's the logic of it. But a lot of people aren't convinced by mere logic, which is sort of an Austrian way of looking at it, and they want to hear something to do with statistics, sort of empirical evidence. Well, what's going on there? The 70% is a, a ratio of all females to all males. But if you break it down by marital status, if you break it down by ever married, never married, not single or, or married, but ever married or never married. Ever married means married, widowed, divorced, separated, anything. If marriage touched your life, you're ever married versus never married. Well, the ratio for the ever married is not any um, 70%, it's more like 40%. And you know what the ratio is for never married? One. The thing is, there's no gap. There's virtually no gap between never married women and never married men. None. The, the statistics vary depending on which country you use, which year you use, what education uh, you put in your regression equation, uh, uh, regression models. But it varies from 0.9 to 1.1. And most of the stuff shows that the never marrieds have no, uh, no gap which indicates the power of this hypothesis, the marital asymmetry hypothesis. So, uh, getting back to this point about um, male chauvinist pigs underpaying women, that's not what's going on. Because look, if suppose you, you have a, a man and a woman and they're right before you and their productivity is $10 each. And you're going to give one of them $10 an hour and the other $7 an hour because she's a woman. In other words, what I'm trying to do is take the logical implication of this wage gap. Well, if you hire the man who's worth $10 an hour, 
marginal revenue practice ten dollars an hour, he can add ten dollars an hour to your bottom line, and you pay him ten dollars, how much do you profit off of him? Zero, which is fine, an equilibrium profit to zero. Well, what about the woman? She's gonna get you the same ten dollars an hour, but you only have to pay her seven dollars an hour. You make three dollars an hour off of her. You make three dollars an hour profit off of her, right? Everyone would hire the woman. Which means that there'd be vast profits if this were true, which it's not, in areas uh, um, dominated by women. Whereas in areas dominated by men, there would be uh, much less profit. And there would be a shift of capital from the places where there's low profit to the places where there's high capital. We don't see the high profit. We don't see any of that. Uh, th this whole thing is crazy. If it were true that women were underpaid, it would pay someone if you were a capitalist pig and the woman was getting seven dollars an hour, what would you do? Hire a bunch of them. Hire a bunch of them at what? What would be your uh, uh, offer? Your wage offer? Forty cents in the dollar. How much? Forty cents in the dollar. No, no, no. They're making seventy cents on the dollar right now. They're making seven dollars for every ten dollars that a man makes. The right answer is seven oh one. Seven oh one because you have to make a little higher to bid them away. But you don't want to you want to make profits, but someone else will say 702, someone else will say 703. And the wage will be bid up to ten dollars an hour. We have this theory in economics called wage is equal marginal revenue product. Wage is equal productivity. Because if there's a gap, something's gonna happen. If the productivity is less than the wage, if the productivity is uh, uh, ten dollars an hour and the wage is twelve dollars an hour, somebody's gonna lose money. And if it's less, then we'll pay it up. So there's a tendency. Is it always true? No. In the market, we have this equilibrium. But the tendency is for wages to equal productivity levels. OK, I've now spoken for about 40 minutes, as I said I would. And now I, uh, we get to the fun part of this. <laughs> Questions, discussion, dialogue. There's the, the man who uh, is my house husband. Yes? Uh, okay. Um, one of the biggest criticism I've heard of libertarianism that I kind of identify with would be the negative impacts of libertarian society would have on the environment. So, how does non aggression fit into the relationship with you and the environment? Uh, for those of you that didn't hear the question, uh, one of the biggest criticisms of libertarianism is that it's not good for the environment. So, let me uh, give you a few examples. First of all, let's take pollution. In the 1830s, there were a spate of pollution, or what they called them, nuisance cases. And you'd get some sort of uh, little old lady who'd uh, put out her laundry, and it was uh, wet and clean. And she'd come back two hours later, and it would be dry but dirty. And she'd go to court, and she'd say, that there factory polluted my laundry. I want two things. I want damages and I want an injunction. Damages means I want them to pay for this. An injunction meant a court order to get them to stop it, otherwise you put them in jail. Or there'd be a farmer who would say, that there railroad, it had sparks that go 300 feet and it got my uh, haystacks all on fire and I want the same thing, damages and an injunction. Did all the environmental plaintiffs win in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s? No. But many of them did. Namely, we had libertarian law. Pollution is a trespass of property. Look, if I take my garbage, eggshells, orange peels, coffee grounds, and I dump it on their front lawn, we know what happens to me. I go to jail. You, know, they just, you think you're crazy. But if I incinerate it and then send, these dust uh, send this garbage over to you in the form of dust particles, all of a sudden it's not trespass, it's pollution? No, it's trespass. And as a result, what was happening in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s is uh, we had environmental forensics. It wasn't very uh, sophisticated, but uh, chemists were trying to figure out where did this dust particle come from? Ah, that factory. So that was good. We had an incentive for people to use expensive anthracite coal rather than cheap burning sulfur coal. Because if you use the anthem, if you use the sulfur coal, you get these people on your tail and, and you go to jail. You'd have to use the clean burning anthracite coal. So things were pretty good in the 1830s and 50s. In the so-called progressive period, 1880s, 1890s, what do they say in basketball? We're number one, football, we're number one. Well, who was number one in the 1890s? 
Britain, U.S. was not number one. Britain was the imperialist world power. <coughs> How do you become number one? By letting little old ladies and farmers sue uh, railroads and, and uh, factories? No. So in the 1890s, a new philosophy took over the legal system. The new philosophy was, yeah, yeah, they're violating your property rights. You're thinking lousy, selfish private property rights. There's something more important than mere private property rights. That's the public good. And what does the public good consist of? Public good consists of the U.S. becoming an imperialist nation. So we're not going to uphold your, your law. Now, of course, there's no sense of doing environmental forensics. There's no sense in factories putting meshes in their chimneys to keep the, uh, the dust particles to themselves. There's no sense in using a clean burning anthracite coal. You might as well use the sulfur coal because if you don't, uh, if you use the anthracite coal, your competitors will have competed. Right? So of course you have environmental problems, but that's not because of libertarianism, it's because of the exact opposite of libertarianism. And then in the uh, 1940s and 1950s, uh, you had really big problems with dust particles, with pollution. People had to wear masks, and it was just very bad situation. So instead of going back to private property rights, we went to the EPA. And we said the market failed. Libertarianism was no good. But the point is the exact opposite. Let me give you one more example. Let's talk about species extinction. Why is it that the cow never came within a million miles of extinction, and the buffalo almost did? There was this movie, Dances with Wolves, very good movie, some of you might have seen that where uh, people were just slaughtering uh, buffalo. Why? Why one became almost extinct and the other never did? Private property rights. If you own the cow, the alternative cost of, ch of killing the cow is no cow tomorrow, which is a big price. But a buffalo that's running here and there, if you don't kill it now, you're not going to have it tomorrow. So the cost to you of killing it today are virtually zero. So you kill it. Demand curve slope downward. The cheaper it is, the more you do it. Elephants are just uh, buffalo with funny noses. All right. The way to sell it, save the elephants is to have private property. If you had private property, people would take care of these these creatures. They would protect them. Could you shoot one of them? Yeah, but you'd have to pay for it. You'd have to pay a lot for a pregnant female elephant shooting, whereas you shot a, an older male because. The, they can't produce anymore an older female. You can, the private property owner will allow you to shoot them for a cheaper price, and we would save these creatures. So here are two examples where libertarianism and private property rights uh, go in favor of protecting the environment, not against. Yes, sir, we're in the back. A couple of your titles in the back were a little bit surprised. I mean, one thing was slander and slander and libelous. That seems to me that they are aggressive. Okay, the question is, well, how do you defend slander and libel? Uh, I f always forget which one is which. One is speaking, I think that's slander and libel is writing. Is that right? Okay, the idea is, I say that um, um, uh, Roy Whitehead is a, um, what, what shall I call him? He, he takes showers with baby ducks, or a back of a rubber duck. <laughs> And now no one will deal with him because he takes a bath with rubber duck and, you know, this is despicable. <laughs> and no one will hire him, no one will buy from him. He's really in trouble. I libeled him or slandered him, depending on whether I wrote or spoke this. And what I've really done, according to the argument in favor of Ill, uh, prohibiting these things, is stolen his reputation. Now, his reputation is not something you can grab. It's not a physical thing like his coat or his shoes, but uh, it's very important. He works hard to have a good reputation. When you sell a business, the physical uh, appliances might be only worth a million, and you sell it for three million, but two million is goodwill or reputation. So reputation is very important. And what I did to him is I stole his reputation, which is much worse than stealing his house or his car or something like that, and therefore I should go to jail. What's the argument against this? The argument against this is that reputations consist not of what Roy Whitehead thinks of himself, but what do we all think about him? Namely, our thoughts about him. And from whence sprang our thoughts from us? And who owns our thoughts? We do. 
So you can't steal his reputation, or rather, his reputation consists of our thoughts, and therefore, in changing each other's minds about him, I'm not taking anything that he owns. He doesn't own it. It's very similar with intellectual property, which I'll get to in a second, um, but let me stick to this. Uh, the idea here is you, you can't own, you can only own certain things, and you can't own your reputation because your reputation consists of the thoughts of other people, and you don't own them, therefore you don't own your thoughts, therefore paradoxically, even though you work hard to make your reputation, and even though you can benefit from it, you still don't own it. It's a weirdo, weird kind of a situation. That's one paradox. Another paradox is reputations would be safer, not more endangered, if we didn't have libel laws. Because right now, if I say something like this, people say, well, you know, where the smoke is, it must be fire, you know, maybe he doesn't take a bath with a rubber ducky, maybe he takes it with a rubber kangaroo, who knows, but he takes a bath with something that he shouldn't be taking a bath with, it, and therefore he's a no good nick. But in an era where we had full free speech, you know, right now we have uh, houses for sale, we have cars for sale, we have uh, work uh, columns in the newspaper for work. We'd have columns of slander and libel. And the, it would go thick and fast. This one's a jerk, this one's a moron, that one's this one, this one's a commie, that one's a lesbian, this one's this. No longer would the mere allegation suffice to ruin a reputation. Now people would say, well, Block said it, but is it true? This really uh, helps people like the New York Times. If they say something and you don't like it, you think they're slandering, well, they've got tons of lawyers, you're in trouble. They're slandering you. Whereas, if there were no such law, uh, as I say, the slander and libel would come so thick and so fast that no longer would it have the power to ruin reputations. So, even though you don't own it, if we got rid of this law, which is incompatible with property rights and with eternism, reputations would be safe. Let me talk just a little bit about intellectual property, because a lot of people ask that. The idea is, you, the reason we have private property is because of scarcity. Coats are scarce. If I'm wearing this coat, you can't wear it. I'm wearing this tie, you can't wear it. But if I know that E, e equals MC squared, you can know it, and your knowing of it doesn't detract from my knowing of it. Namely, we can both know it, therefore it's not scarce in that sense. When girl A puts, is the first one to put her hair up in a ponytail, and girl B puts her hair up in a ponytail. If girl A goes up to girl B and says, and, and undoes her, undoes her hair, girl, girl A still can have a ponytail. Girl B didn't steal anything from her. So the idea here is uh, property rights only uh, apply properly to areas where there's scarce property, and ideas are not scarce. Now, there are two ways to look at this. One is the utilitarian, one is the deontological rights. In terms of rights, the problem with, suppose I say, I believe in, in patents or copyright. I just use four or five words. I believe in copyrights, four words. According to the idea of intellectual property, I have no right to use that property because Mr. I invented the word I, Mr. Believe invented the word believe, who am I to use those words? And I can't even speak if I really believe in them. Now you might say, well, patents only last for 25 years, but that's a content. Because if you really own it, like I own this code, I own it forever. I can give it to my kid, he can give it to his kid, uh, if it lasts that long, right? So if ideas were really property, Mr. I and Mr. Believe should own those words forever, no one else should be able to speak them. So it's a little weird to have a philosophical position that you can't even articulate. Okay, now for the utilitarian. Uh, the argument is if we don't have patents and copyrights, we're not going to have any new ideas. We're not going to have any new uh, um, uh, computer programs, uh, computer code. We're not going to have any new uh, drugs. We're not going to have any um, cars or whatever the next invention is. And here I say it's really a horse race. On the one hand, yes, patents and copyrights will confer a benefit, and if I have them, um, more people will... Uh, will produce things like books. So for example, take this book. Suppose one of you is a much better marketer than I am. I'm a lousy marketer. I haven't even sold one thing in my book yet. Suppose somebody says, Defending the Undefendable by Roy Whitehead. I'll pick on Roy. Now he can't do that because that would be fraud. But what he could do is 
This is defending the undefendable by Walter Block, as brought to you by Roy Weiner. And now I don't get any um, uh, uh, any fees when the book is sold, and I have less of an incentive to use the book, uh, to create the book in the first place, right? But on the other hand, my speaking fees go up, because everyone's got the book, many more people have it, because Roy is a much better marketer than I am, and my speaking fees goes up. Look, suppose you have a band, and I uh, pirate your music, and I sell it all over the place. Well now, a lot of more people are going to want to have you give a concert than before, so it's unclear as to whether I'm helping you or hurting you. Next question. How does fraud differ from libel or slander? How does fraud differ from slander or libel? Well, fraud... Uh, Fraud would be prohibited in the libertarian uh, legal code because if I sell you a 10 pounds of potatoes, you can eat five bucks, and then you open up the bag and it's 10 pounds of rocks, I've defrauded you. In effect, I've stolen ten dollars from you. So fraud would be equivalent to that. I agree, but, but so is, but, but it's based upon a false statement. Which is so is Sorry, I can't. But, but based upon a false statement, which so is slander and libel, which can get somebody killed in court. Well, it's not just a false statement. Uh, what he says is based on a false statement. It's not just a false statement. In effect, what I've done is stolen $10 from you. Yeah. But when I say that you, uh, you're a, a socialist or something, everyone hates you, uh, you don't own the truth. You don't own your reputation. Your reputation consists of our thoughts. And therefore, I haven't stolen anything from you. But you said I was a murderer. Suppose I say you're a murderer. Uh, but in a free society, everyone's going to be saying everything. You're a murderer, you're a thief, you're a rapist, you're this, you're that. No longer will a mere, will a mere allegation, will a mere statement be as powerful it is now as it now is. Now you have to prove it. Sure. Right. Uh, one way to reduce, uh, say, um, um, uh, what do you call it? The use of gasoline is to have a high gasoline tax or to have compulsory laws that you have to have 50 miles a gallon or something. And one way to reduce tobacco use is to tax the hell out of it. Well, the anarchists have been turned against all taxes. Uh, Murray Rothbard, my mentor, uh, was once asked, well, which tax do you favor if you had to favor one tax? And he said, the head tax, or the poll tax. Namely, everyone pays the same amount, and taxes be limited by the amount that the poorest person can pay. So you keep taxes low. Uh, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a part of the nanny state, where the government is, you know, uh, what's his name, the mayor of... Um, Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg in New York is saying you can't have 16 ounces of uh, orange or soda or something like that. I mean, this is just the nanny state. It's really against democracy because if people are so stupid <laughs> that they don't know what kind of soda to drink or whether they should smoke or not, how are they smart enough to vote? You shouldn't let them vote if they're that stupid. <laughs> it's, you know, it's an incompatibility between voting and, and, uh, and having to have a nanny state. So I, I would say I'm opposed to all taxes in general because taxes are theft, but I'm particularly opposed to nanny state taxes where they try to uh, get you to do what they think is best for you because we're, we're not children, we're adults. Who, who are they to tell us whether we should do this or that? That's just a, a lot of uh, chutzpah on their part. Yes, sir. So talking about libel and what about per what about perjury? Which, which is what about perjury? Uh, well, I would say that if you're sworn in and that you're now having a contractual obligation, I think jurors shouldn't be uh, drafted; they should be paid. And if I pay you to be a juror or a witness, we shouldn't have a draft for witnesses or jurors. We now have a contractual arrangement, and if you violate that. By lying, well, then you violated our contract and we get you on that. Then. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, where do children of work into libertarian theory, especially the self? We're been talking about self uh, rational adults contracting, basically. But where do children fit in, like in child labor laws and things like that? Uh, child labor laws. Uh, and what's the libertarian view on children? Um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, the reason uh, we don't have uh, child labor is because of child labor laws. 
But imagine uh, if the child labor laws were inculcated um, way earlier, when everyone had to work or people would die, like in, say, the 14th century, where children uh, usually worked. Or hours legislation. Suppose they said you can only work 40 hours, where if you only work 40 hours, you would die. So what happens is as society progresses, we get richer and richer, we have to work fewer and fewer hours. So the government passes laws saying you have to work fewer and fewer hours. And children, younger children don't have to work. So they pass laws saying uh, younger and younger children shouldn't have, or, or they should be prohibited from working. Namely, they try to take credit for what is the result of, of economic progress based on capitalism. <laughs> If we had child labor laws in Bangladesh, a lot of kids would have to be going prostitutes or would die. It's not going to help them. I mean, if you could bring about progress by the legislative pen, that would be wonderful. But we can't. Economic progress doesn't come by a Senate and a Congress and a President passing the law, because if it could, we all be rich, like take the minimum wage law. That's another example where we're trying to help people, presumably. In the first instance, minimum wage law is trying to help people because if we say no one can get less than, what is it, $8 an hour now in many states and the federal, well then people who are making six, five, six, seven will be pushed up to eight. So what they think of the minimum wage law is, is a, a floor under wages, pushing wages up. Well, if it's so good, why don't we make it for $100 an hour? if it could work. Why are we being so niggardly, so cheap-skaty about it? The truth of the matter is that the minimum wage law is not a floor on the wages that the higher the floor is, the higher wages go. Rather, it's a barrier over which you have to jump to get a job. You know, in, in high jumping in the Olympics, they can now jump eight feet high. Well, I, I, when I was young, I, I could jump over a chair like that. <laughs> Now, the, the way I, I show, uh, I illustrate it is I take a, a book like this and I show that I can jump over a book. Whoa, that was a rough one. The, the minimum wage law is a barrier over which you have to jump in order to get the job. If your productivity is $5 an hour and the minimum wage is $8 an hour, that means the employer will lose three dollars an hour if he hires you. Who's going to hire you? You're going to be unemployed. So it's not helping you. Well, why then do we have one economic illiteracy? A lot of people haven't taken uh, principles at UCA. Well, I'm sure they teach this stuff. The other is a little bit more nefarious. Unions favor raising minimum wage laws because when they as for a wage increase, say, from $25 to $28, the first thing the employer thinks of is firing a few skilled workers and hiring a few unskilled workers to take their places. Because it's very rare they have fixed proportions. You can make the shoe in, in any number of ways with skilled and unskilled labor. So the last thing the union wants is for the employer to start hiring unskilled workers. And in the old blue-collar days, what they would do is call them scabs and beat them up. The problem with that is the scabs can fight back. So now what you do is you have a minimum wage law that unemploys them. And, and meanwhile, you can take credit for being, uh, you know, uh, beneficial to the downtrodden workers. So in all these cases, whether it's child labor laws or maximum hours legislation or minimum wage, it doesn't help. And it's a violation of pro property rights because you're putting people in jail for consenting adult behavior. If I were to hire Shirley for $3 an hour, I could go to jail, even though she agreed to. Now, she's not going to agree to it, but if we did, I mean, to put people in jail for, for a commercial interaction like that is certainly against the deterrence. Yes, sir. Yes, I am the bear. Gracia, bear. What's your take on the notion of age of consent? So, or getting back to childhood. The notion of an age of consent, so I, I make the suggestion, hey little boy, hey little girl, why don't we? And I'm not uh, emotionally browbeating them, I'm not threatening them hard, but it still might not be something that the, the child as an adult would say, yes, that was a wonderful thing. 
age of consent laws, what's the libertarian view on that? The libertarian view on that, as I understand it, and that's a complicated issue, is that it's a continuum problem. We know that a five-year-old girl cannot give consent, even if she agrees to go to bed with it. We know that a 25-year-old girl, or woman, certainly can give consent if she goes to bed with it. But what about a 15-year-old girl? It's difficult. There's no one right answer coming from libertarianism, and there's no one right answer coming from anywhere. This is just one of the imponderables. It's a continuum problem. It's very similar to punching. Uh, suppose I go over and I go like that to you. Would he be right to pull out a gun and shoot me? No. Because in this context, when he knows it's just a hypothetical example, and I'm standing way further away from him than a fist can reach, and he knows that I'm not going to do this, it's just an example, if he were to take out a gun and shoot me, he would, not, he would be the initiator of violence. But if I get really close, and if it's dark, and it's not in the context of a lecture, and maybe there's a glint from my watch and he doesn't know if it's a watch or a, a, a knife, then if he shoots me, he would be in the right and I would be in the wrong. But how close do I have to be? Is it five feet, four feet, three feet? It's a continuum. It depends on the context. It depends on reasonable men. In some societies, the age is 13. In some societies, it's 18. You get uh, anomalies because um, kids at 18 are old enough to fight in the army, but not old enough to drink a beer. You get anomalies like that. So I don't think libertarians have anything more to contribute to this than anyone else. It's a problem that every political philosophy faces. And what is it uh, medical science nowadays? They're developing a brain study to show that the development of the brain in a young person, 15, 16, is a lot less developed than if you're 21 or 2. So you can't make rational decisions if your brain is not developed. But what this man is saying that brain science is now discovering that 15 and 16 year olds really kind of mush brains. I'm putting words in this now. But. <coughs> aren't really sensible, well, that would be a good argument for raising the uh, age of consent or raising whatever. But, you know, should it be 16 or 17 or 18? The political philosophy, as I understand it, can't say, well, it's got to be 17 and a half. Where do you get that from? And maybe in 100 years, people will be more mature and we should raise or lower the age a little. Uh, this is a, an issue that all political philosophies face and libertarianism along with them, it doesn't really have a definitive answer. You can't say the age of consent for this is 15, for that it's 17. It's a continual problem. Just as we can't say how close does the fist have to be to the nose before the recipient of the fist can take uh, uh, violent action in defense. It depends on the context. Reasonable men, things like that. Reasonable people. Uh, yes? You mentioned that uh, when Portugal uh, legalized marijuana, the usage went down. Has that helped through like in California? Uh, I mentioned that in Portugal, when they legalized marijuana, uh, the usage went down. Is this true in California? Well, in California, I don't think it's legal yet. It's only legal for medical marijuana. Um, I, I don't know the statistics on that. But look, even if it went up in Portugal, I mean, the fear is that everyone will be uh, drugged out of their gourd. Uh, nothing like that is happening. And Right now, most people, if they really want these drugs, they can get them anyway. So it, it's not as if they're going to you know, have much more access. Uh, take the case of alcohol. Did the use of alcohol go up? It's hard to say because you don't have the statistics when it's illegal. But the point is, people actually died of bad tough chin. One of my favorite characters, Lenny Bruce, uh, died of a, not an overdose of heroin, but of heroin that, that was impure. And the cops knew it, and they wanted him dead because he made fun of them. This is just a horrible case. In all of these areas, the issue is not so much how much we'll use, but it's a violation of rights. Adults have a right to put any crap in their body that they want. And, uh, and, and it's the same thing for, uh, what is it called, when the doctor has to give you a prescription? Why does the doctor have to give you a prescription? I mean, the doctor can give you advice. But right now, in order to get uh, penicillin or something, or whatever it is you want, you have to get permission of an, uh, of an adult or <coughs> a person. When you're an adult, that's part of the nanny state also. So that would end with uh, libertarianism. Yes, sir? What is your view that uh, what the libertarian philosophy of the libertarian court, uh, or at least one of the most important factors, 
what actions should the Libertarian Party in particular or Libertarianism in general take to promote liberty? Well, I'm a sort of a multiculturalist on this one. I have a thousand flowers bloom, as Uncle Mao said, uh, different strokes for different folks. Uh, I personally uh, teach at the uh, I used to teach here at UCA, I now teach at Loyola. Some of my students don't want to get PhDs and become professors. I give lectures like this, I write books, I write articles to try to convert the heathen to the one true faith. <laughs> other people do other things. There's this um, a sea setting where they're trying to get a bunch of boats tied together and make a country out of it. There's this um, a thing in, um, where is it? Um, the, not Vermont, but um, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. The Free State Project, where they encourage people to all move to New Hampshire. Uh, Mises Institute, I'm a big fan of the Mises Institute. They promote uh, liberty, they promote Austrian economics. Uh, there are many, many ways to liberty, Ron Paul. I mean, uh, running for office. Some people run for a local alderman or something, or mayor of a small town and can promote liberty in that way. I favor all of them. May I follow up with just one question that's related to what? What would you say to someone who wants that? Uh, and they, they really can see the importance of what they can see that it's important to society and it's actually important, but they're still fooled somewhat by some of the devices and the opportunity to uh, emerge and serve some of the stuff. What is the standard of abortion, no constitution? How do you uh, view uh, approach to that? Some of the uh, I'll put words in his mouth, but the gist of what he said, I think, is uh, uh, how about people who are on the fence? They're thinking of liberty, but they're teetering between liberty and non-liberty, uh, particularly with issues of abortion, and what was the other one? Gay marriage. Gay marriage. Well, uh, gay marriage is a lot easier. Abortion is a very complicated issue. Uh, gay marriage, uh, the libertarian view, as I understand it, and remember I said if you have 10 libertarians in the room, you're going to get um, 11 answers. Uh, the government should have no, nothing to say about marriage. There should be separation of church and state, separation of education and state, separation of marriage and state. Marriage should be a, a contract between people. It should be uh, between two men, two women, a man and a woman, a man and five women, five, uh, a, a woman and five men, polyandry, polygamy, whatever. Anything uh, that's agreed upon. And the government should not say that this is okay and that's not okay. Um, people are people and everyone has equal rights. The issue of abortion is a very complicated one. Uh, and I think that my views are correct and that Ron Paul's view uh, about pro-life and Gary Johnson about pro-choice are both incorrect. And the reason abortion is such a, a difficult issue is because it's a complicated issue. It's a two-stage thing. It's very similar to labor union. So let me introduce labor unions first. What's the libertarian view on labor unions? Well, it depends on what labor unions do. If labor unions limit themselves to mass quit, that's fine, or that's, that should be legal. Look, if one person has a right to quit, other people can quit also. Although the early days of antitrust law was that one person could quit, but you couldn't quit en masse because that was a restraint of trade. Quitting is very important. The only problem with slavery is you couldn't quit. Otherwise, slavery wasn't so bad. You pick cotton, you sing songs, they give you rules. It's not so bad. But you couldn't quit. So quitting is the right to quit. Uh, free association is very important. Otherwise, you have compulsory slavery. But unions do a second thing in addition to having a mass quit. And the idea is if one guy goes into the boss and says, hey, I need a raise, the boss says, you know, there's the highway, or there's the door, don't let it hit you on the way out. But if one guy comes and says, I represent all 500 workers, and we all want our work, a wage increase, and if you don't give it to us, we're all going to quit. Now the boss starts thinking, you know, maybe uh, I've got contracts I have to fulfill, maybe I should uh, give him a couple of cents or something. So a union is legitimate if they limit themselves to mass quit. But they do one other thing. Namely, they try to prevent entry. 
They quit, and then they surround the plant, and then they say that the, the scabs can't come in, and trucks can't come in and come out. It's very similar to the case of divorce. It's a tragedy of a husband and wife divorce. But imagine if the husband surrounded the ex-wife's house with his friends, and anyone else she wanted to date, they would beat them up. That's roughly what the union does. So the libertarian answer to unions is, if they limit themselves to mass quits, unions are legitimate, they're compatible with libertarianism. If they do this other stuff, namely violate the non-aggression principle, then they're not. Now let's take abortion. Abortion, too, is a, a double stage. When you abort, what you're really doing is killing and evicting. Killing and evicting. Uh, the killing in part is easy to see. They have this thing called partial birth abortion. And in the eighth month or the ninth month, the baby is almost ready to come out and they go in and suck its brains out and then pull it out dead, even though the baby is viable. So you have to distinguish between evicting a baby and killing it. Now, whether it's an eviction or not depends upon the private property rights. Get back the private property rights. All you need for libertarian is parent. You put the parent says, private property rights, private property rights, and you an answer. <laughs> so who owns the, the private property rights of the, of the womb? The mother. Therefore, the fetus is a trespasser. The unwanted fetus is a trespasser. And the mother has a right to evict, but not kill. Because killing is a violation of rights, but evicting is not, because she owns the property. Now, it's easy to see in the case of rape that it's an invader, the, the fetus. I mean, the fetus itself is innocent. The children are not guilty of the parents' uh, crimes. But the uh, fetus, the baby who is a, a product of rape, a woman is walking down the street, she gets grabbed, she gets impregnated. And the, the person who is growing in her body is, is a trespasser. Now, I take the view that a fertilized egg is a human being. Uh, life starts not at birth, but life starts at the uh, fertilized stage. By the way, do you know when the uh, fetus is viable in the Jewish tradition? When it graduates medical school? <laughs> <laughs> So it's easy to see in the case of rape, but what about the case where the woman invites the fetus in by having voluntary sexual intercourse? I still say, if she changes her mind, it's an invader. If I invite you to my house, and I, I say, uh, you know, you've been here a couple of hours, please leave. I change my mind, I don't want you here anymore, it's my house. Now, if I invite you up into my airplane, or if I invite you to my boat, and now we're 500 miles away, I have an implicit contract with you, and I believe in implicit contracts. Namely, if I go in and, uh, to a restaurant, and I order a cup of coffee and drink at the end, and then they present me a bill for $5 trillion, if they want me to pay $5 trillion for their coffee, it's incumbent upon them to tell me that. The, the implicit contract is when they give me coffee, and I drink it, it's a buck or two, or even five, or something like that, but not a hundred and not a million. So I believe in implicit contracts, but for there to be a, an implicit contract, there have to be two people. Now forget about this host-mother contract. A man and a woman, a woman is infertile, so the, the husband's sperm goes to the host-mother, and now she contractually agrees to have the baby. She can't change her mind, because she agreed to a contract. And if she changed her mind, she'd be guilty of fraud, as we were talking about before. But forget about that. Has there been a contract, forget about the, the man, has there been a contract between the woman and the fertilized egg? Assuming that the fertilized egg is enough, old enough to have a contract. No. Let me explain the birds and the bees to you people. <laughs> the way it works is first the sperm goes into the vagina, and then a couple of hours later, or a couple of minutes later, it, it fertilizes the egg. So at the time of intercourse, there isn't anyone else there to have an implicit contract with. Now, what would be the benefits of my view of evictionism, namely you have a right to evict at any time but never to kill? In one fell swoop, all babies in the third trimester would be safe. None of them could be victimized by partial birth abortion. Because the woman would only have the right to evict, not to kill, and presumably a baby in the eighth month is viable outside the womb, and uh, some other host parents could take the baby. And also notice, that right now, with present medical technology, it's the last trimester. But in 10 or 20 or 30 years, it'll probably be the sixth month and then the fifth month. 
as medical technology progresses, babies will be viable outside of the womb earlier and earlier. You know in 500 years, a fertilized egg can be put in a, a test tube or a petri dish or God knows what that they'll have in 500 years if we don't blow ourselves up by then. And then all babies will be saved. So I'm really, at bottom, a pro-life kind of person. I like life. I favor human life. I'm a pro-human person. And I think that right now, we pro-lifers have to admit we're losing the war. Right now, there are babies being killed in, in the last trimester that need not be. And if we adopt this policy, eventually all babies will be saved. Whereas if we stick to pro-life, no babies will ever be saved. Because Obama won, and he favors abortion, and he favors subsidizing abortion out of people's money who don't like it, which is you know, even a worse sort of a thing. So to summarize this, it's a very complicated case. Uh, I've written about it a lot. I must have 15 journal articles on it. If you're interested in it, email me. Um, my email address <laughs> it's wblock at wino, L O Y N O dot E D U. Email me, say abortion or evictionism, and I'll send you more articles than you want about this. Uh, I deal with a lot of objections to it. It's a very complicated issue, uh, but I think that it is compatible with the non-aggression principle in private property rights, which is, remember at the beginning I said that I look at everything through the eyeglasses of the, the two-sided coin, and that we're very rigid, we libertarians, we apply it to all sorts of cases. Well, this is a perfect case in point. Young lady. Wait, just during the conversation, during the conversation of taxes, you expressed that as a libertarian, The young lady says that um, my view that I espouse with taxes are illegitimate, taxes are theft, but the Constitution, Article 8, Article One, Section, one, section 8, says that the uh, government has a right to tax. And if we didn't tax, how could we have things like armies, courts, police, highways, things like that? Uh, a very good question. And I would say that most libertarians would say we should have taxes, and we should have taxes only for legitimate government functions, which would be very limited to things like that I just mentioned. Uh, so you're really asking me a question not as a libertarian, but as a libertarian anarchist as opposed to a libertarian minarchist. Well, I would say, first of all, who signed the Constitution? I didn't. I must have missed that meeting where they signed the Constitution, because I didn't sign it. I didn't agree to it. None of us did. Therefore, it's not a contract. It's not a binding contract. Uh, let's go back to 1776, and there's a guy out in the boonies of Ohio, and there was only the 13 states, so Ohio was really far out of it. And some guy from Washington, D.C., or Baltimore, or whatever the um, capital was then, Philadelphia, maybe, comes to him and says, we're starting this new club called the United States of America. And the guy says, oh, that's great, I wish you the best of luck, we'll trade, we'll be friends. He says, you don't understand, you're part of it, whether you like it or not. Look, when they started this 13 colonies, it was the unanimity. You know, it had just the majority vote. But the people didn't agree to be bound by it. See, I'm not against democracy if people agree to be bound by the result of the democracy. We have a chess club or a tennis club, and we have to agree what, which day we're going to meet. Wednesday, Thursday, we all agree to put a vote, and then we pick Tuesday. Okay, it's Tuesday. But you have to agree to be bound by the, by the uh, vote. But nobody agreed. Nobody agreed to the Constitution. Um, my favorite anarchist theory, uh, theorist, um, oh, what's his name? Lysander Spoon. Thanks. I'm losing my marbles here. Lysander Spoon said, had a book called The Constitution of No Authority. And the reason it was of no authority is we didn't agree to it. Okay, the 
Other question is, well, how could we then have these services that the government now provides us? And the answer to that is every service that the government has ever provided that's been provided by private enterprise is usually better. Let's take defense first, or oh, police. Where are you safer? Where do you think you'd be safer in um, Disney World or in Central Park, New York City Central Park, or in Audubon Park in New Orleans, or on the city streets of Detroit? Obviously, you're safer in Disney World, because in Disney World, if a murder or rape occurs there, they lose big bucks. So if you act obstreperously, you'll be surrounded by a bunch of uh, ducks and mice, water packing heat, <laughs> and they say, come with us, sir. And I've got all sorts of cameras there. And the same thing for uh, the, the malls or the uh, Walmart. They have guards there to make sure that people behave. And you're very safe there. Whereas if you go out on the city streets or these parks or other places and you get murdered or raped, does the, the, the owner of that lose money? Does Mayor Giuliani or Mayor Bloomberg lose money when somebody gets mugged in Central Park? No. If Central Park were privatized and I owned it, I'd make sure that it was really safe there, because if it wasn't safe there, I couldn't charge you to come there. And so that's police. Um, uh, uh, roads. I have another book and I'm on, on highways. Why we should have private highways. Uh, some 40,000 people die on the highways nowadays. And nobody talks about that. Everybody talks about 9-11, when only a stinking lousy 3,000 people died. Not that I'm callous. Um, I regret the death of each one of those 3,000 people. Who was only 3,000 people? Katrina, it wasn't Katrina's fault. It was FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers. Between them, they killed 1,900 people. The horror. But every year, some almost 40,000 people die on the government socialist highways. If we had private highways, and I own the I-40, and you own the I-30, we would be competing as to see who could reduce speed, uh, 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 who could reduce deaths. Now, maybe it's not speed. Maybe it's the variation or the standard deviation of speed. Right now, that, that highway, I-40, I the maximum speed is 70, and the minimum speed is 40. I used to have a 190cc motorcycle. I'd get out on the highway like a maniac. I could do 40 with a tailwind, <laughs> but uphill with a passenger and headwind, I couldn't do it, but I was out there. And, you know, when they say 70 is the maximum, you do 75 and people go right by you. So the actual speed is somewhere between 35 and, and 80, and then you get these people who sit in the left lane doing 55 in the 70 zone, and people are going in and around. Maybe what we should do, instead of having a minimum uh, 40 and maximum 70, is uh, the right-hand lane should be 50, the middle one 65, and the left-hand lane should be 80. I don't know, maybe it should be, but if we had private roads, road owners would be competing to reduce deaths, and some of them might try that, and maybe if that worked, we'd reduce deaths, whereas right now the rules of the road come from Washington, D.C. And every once in a while they have the double nickel, 55 miles an hour, which you know, just sort of creep along, especially uh, in unpopulated places like Arkansas and West Mississippi. So to answer your question, uh, taxes are unjust because we didn't agree to pay them. If we agree to pay them, as we agree to, look, when you join the golf club, you agree to pay the dues. If you don't pay the dues, they kick you out. And you agree. But we didn't agree to the Constitution. So the Constitution has no authority. And all of the functions that the government provides us have been provided much better because of profit and loss and weeding out of inefficiency in the private I have an immediate response to this. Why is it necessary to have an agreement on the cons on the Constitution? But uh, when we're in McDonald's, we enter there, and the implicit thing is understood. So most people would say it's implicit if you agree to live in or enter the United States, you'll abide by its rules. But uh, before I surrender the microphone, I wonder if you treat the audience to your views on animal rights. I think they'd like to hear that. <laughs> Well, uh, two questions, uh, one on animal rights and the other on, um, isn't there an implicit contract that if you live here, you agree to be bound by the rules of it? Look, there were people who were living here before it started. They homesteaded land, and they gave it to their children and their grandchildren, and now they're sitting in their land, and they're told that they have to be part of this agreement, it's an implicit agreement that if you live here, you agree, and it seems to me it would be a circular argument. Uh, you, can, you can just, with as much justice, say, uh, that if you agree to live here, we agree to be free enterprise, and therefore all tax people should leave. Let them leave. Why should we leave? 
Uh, with regard to animal rights, I regard that as the weakest part of libertarianism. And I'm looking for solutions, and I've never found it. See, uh, I, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan. I believe we have a right to kill them, but I don't believe we have the right to torture them. I, I'm against torturing animals. Uh, in favor of cleanly killing or painlessly killing animals, but not torturing them. And what I really like is a way to show that if you torture an animal, you're violating some rule, and therefore we could come get you. But I can't think of one. So I, uh, the only thing we can have is we can boycott them. But I want to do more than boycott them. I want to really kick them in the butt, or do unto them as they're doing to the animals, teach them what it feels like. And yet there is no proviso or provision in libertarianism to get animal torturers. And if anyone can think of one, I'll be your best friend forever. <laughs> Another question or comment or running? Oh yeah, guy in the green. What's your view on that death penalty? Death penalty. Uh, let me not just talk about the death penalty. But let me talk about libertarian punishment theory, of which the death penalty is about one part. I believe in two teeth for a tooth plus cost of capture plus scary. So suppose I steal uh, this piece of paper from Bill. What should my punishment be? Well, first, I've got to give him back a piece of paper, because it's his. Second, I have to give him a piece of paper of mine of equal value, because what I did to him should be done to me. So that's the second tooth. Not 1.9 teeth, or 2.1 teeth, but two teeth. If I steal a TV, first I give back the TV that I stole, and then I give my own TV of equal value. And if I don't have one, then of equal value. The third one is cost of capture. Now, after I stole this piece of paper from Bill, if I immediately return and say, oh, sorry, you know, I don't know what happened, I had a brain cramp, or, or I went to the police, Joe's the police, I said, Joe, you know, I stole this paper, you know, here I am, do unto me whatever the law says, well, then there are no costs of capture. But if I um, make my crime worse by not only stealing the piece of paper from Bill, but then hiding, and you all have to come look for me, well, I have to pay for the cost of looking for me. And then the fourth one is scare. Now, when I took his piece of paper, he uh, he got scared. You know, assault and battery. Uh, assault is putting people in, in fear. Battery is actually touching them. I put him in fear. I assaulted him. I made him scared. Now, if he's Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody like that, he's not going to be too scared. But I'm talking about the reasonable man. I put him in. You know, he, he no longer has the security uh, that uh, people will come along and take his property. So I have, to, I have to be scared. Now, how are we going to scare me? You go like this, boom? No. What we're going to do is make me play Russian roulette with the number of bullets and the number of chambers proportionate to how badly I scare them. Now, if I came uh, and pickpocketed him, and he didn't even notice that I took the paper out, I hardly scared him. So maybe one bullet and uh, 50,000 chambers. But it's possible I could have the death penalty for just taking that piece of paper. Unlikely. On the other hand, if I came with a gun and I said, uh, give me the paper, I'll blow you away, I'd really scare them. So, you know, uh, we have a much higher number of bullets and a much lower number of chambers. Now, with regard to the death penalty, what I did when I killed somebody is I stole his life. Therefore, I have to give two lives back. Now, I don't have them because we're not cats, we don't have nine lives, but if we were cats, and we had nine lives, I'd have to give two lives, plus cost of cat trying to scare him. But I stole his life. Now look, one day we're going to have a machine that if you put, um, here's the machine. And I'm going to put in a, a dead guy, and I'm going to make him frown because he's dead. <laughs> And this is before. It, it, can you see this? Can you see it in the back? No. We ought to have better pens. <laughs> and, and this is ah, uh, this is maybe better. This is after. And here is the uh, victim, and here is the killer. And I'm going to make him smile because he's alive. And I'm going to flick a switch. And the light is going to go out of him and into him. And now he's going to come out smiling because he's alive. And this guy is going to come out 
friendly because he's now dead. Would I have a right to force the murderer to get into that box and flip the switch and take the life out of the murderer and put it into the victim? You're darn tootin'. I mean, if that's not what justice is in the case of murder, then nothing is just. Because the murderer stole his life, you ought to get at least one back. So the death penalty is justified, namely it is justified to take the life of the murderer. Now, you don't have to take the life of the We don't have that machine, by the way. <laughs> if you look, in 100,000 years, we'll probably have a machine like that. But right now, we don't have it, but we've established by use of this hypothetical machine that your life is forfeit. The murderer's life is forfeit. And he can't give it to the dead victim, but he can give it to the dead victim's wife. Suppose I kill a guy who has a wife and two little kids. Well, the wife now owns my life. She can enslave me. She could execute me publicly and charge admission. <laughs> she could do whatever she wishes with me because she now owns my life. So slavery is justified for murderers. Slavery is also justified on a voluntary basis. Uh, my son has a dread disease, and he's going to die. And uh, Morgan over here has long wanted me to be his slave, and he's very rich, and he's got five million. And uh, I tell Morgan, I'll, I'll be your slave if you give me five million. And I take the five million, I give it to my son's doctors, because I value my son's life more than my freedom. He values my... Uh, servitude more than the five million, so we have a contract. We have voluntary slavery, very different than coercive slavery. And now he whips me, and I say, aha, assault and battery. I call him the cops. Well, the cops should say, sorry. He has a right to whip you because he's just like So I hope I've answered your question. Oh, yeah, my argument that tell me uh, presupposed that person's guilty. Yeah, sure, he's innocent. Well, I mean, Yes, DNA has shown a lot of evidence against the death penalty. That is a good argument against the death penalty. I, I admit it's a good utilitarian argument against the death penalty. And by the way, Rothbard says that anyone executing uh, an innocent person is guilty of murder. So that might slow down the execution rate. Right? But I was speaking sort of from a God's eye point of view, assuming we know that he's guilty and we have that machine. We're running out of time. Uh, time for maybe one more question. One or two more questions. Young man in, in purple. I'd like to hear your thoughts on like, the Federal Reserve versus like uh, the government issuing its own money, such as greenbacks, versus maybe like alternative currencies. Uh, the question is the Federal Reserve versus the Fed versus um, uh, greenbacks versus the gold standard, which would be my favorite. Uh, the reason the gold standard is my favorite is because whenever free, people were free to choose, now, Milton Friedman has a book called Free to Choose, but he's not free to choose in monetary if you know, <laughs> goddamn pinko. <laughs> Whenever there were, where people were free to choose between what money to intermediate their trade, they usually pick gold. Bananas are no good because they rot. <laughs> diamonds are no good because if you try to make change in them, you lose value in the, in the value of the diamond. <coughs> Small diamonds are not worth as much as a big diamond. Uh, gold is uh, hard to... Uh, fool people about, you can easily tell what gold is. So for these reasons, gold and silver uh, usually were the money. And when gold and silver were the money, we had no problems. Uh, we didn't have uh, problems with business cycles, recession, inflation, and unemployment, and all those things. But the problem from the, go uh, from the government's point of view with the gold standard, see the government's only got three ways to raise money. Taxes, borrowing, and printing money. Problem with taxes, everyone knows who's doing the taxes. Even Obama couldn't say, well, taxes are really the fault of um, private people. Everyone knows the government is taxing, and everyone knows the government is borrowing and crowding out. But they don't realize who is doing the inflation. They think that it's greed or, or capitalism or something that's responsible for inflation. So they hate gold with a purple passion, and statists like Milton Friedman support them in favor of. Uh, you know, uh, fiat currency. Uh, I think the libertarian answer is not gold, because if silver wins or platinum wins, you know, that's fine. But the reason we say gold standards is because whenever people were free to choose, they chose gold and silver. Last question. Uh, yes, sir. So you talked about making drugs legal. 
would that have an effect on businesses' ability to regulate whether or not their employees use drugs? Uh, I talked about making drugs legal, but what about uh, businesses saying that they don't want their employees to use drugs? Well, it's a contract. Look, if I hire you, you have to wear a papilla beanie, and you have to push a peanut in front of your nose. If you agree, you got to do it. And if my now, if I had, if I impose that, I'm not going to get too many employees, or I'm going to have to pay them a lot. But I can say I don't want anyone to drink or, or drug or smoke, whether on uh, 24 seven. And people may or may not work for me, so that's freedom. Thanks for your attention, and buy the books. <laughs>